So here are the energy bags. We've seen these before. They're, they're containments for holding down compressed air. And most of what we'll talk about today is not how we contain the compressed air, but where it comes from. So these were the containments. Now let's talk about where it comes from. Ideally, what we want is to get that compressed air directly from wind turbines. The, most people think about uh, renewable energy thinking we'll make electricity first and worry about storing later. And I think we should think about storing right from the start. So over here, <clears throat> you see a very simple little model which illustrates the core idea of how you might make compressed air directly from a wind turbine. And if you watch what happens as I spin this slowly, you'll see these small pellets inside compression tubes falling down, always in the downward direction, pulled by gravity. The wind, if the wind were turning this, would be lifting them up, and the pellets fall under gravity. We give energy into the gravitation field, Gra gravity gives it back to us. And the action of the pistons falling inside these tubes can make compressed air. Now that's me driving this thing around. We haven't got enough wind in here to drive it for us, but I have got a little motor that can show what this looks like when it's running smoothly. So the idea is very simple here. This is a scaled down version of a wind turbine which can make compressed air directly. And that compressed air occurs inside the rotor. It gets conducted through a rotating seal here, taken down the framework of the, uh, of the wind turbine, and then runs in pipes underneath the seabed over to these uh, storage bags which we've seen already. These pistons are in the order of two grams. They are many orders of magnitude smaller than the real ones. Um, we've, we've got some challenges with these pistons. In the real machines, these pistons are going to have to be much heavier and they're going to travel a very long distance in their lives, something like 15 million kilometers over a 30-year lifetime. So 15 million kilometers in its lifetime, but all up and down inside one tube about 120 meters long. So there are two big challenges in there. The first challenge is, can we make a nice linear bearing that will enable the piston to travel all that distance and not be scraping against the sides, wearing itself out and the tube. And secondly, can we make a good seal? We need to have 70 atmospheres pressure difference across this piston and not have all the energy waste by rushing past, by the air rushing past the piston. So we're gonna show you a test rig that's in process, but we can show you a, a fairly advanced stage of it for testing these pistons, the linear bearing aspect and the seals. This is uh, Nick Sargent, a project student of mine from last year. Former project student, has now finished his third year project, which was all about the piston testing. This is the tower. We don't see the piston inside it yet because the piston at the moment is right at the bottom of the tower. But we have a tube. It's a honed uh, steel hydraulic tube, a beautiful inside to it, 125 millimeter mirror finish on the inside of this, very accurate diameter. And we have a rope here with which we can pull, and the rope will lift the piston up the tube. It's too hard to pull by hand, so I need a special device to, to help me pull it. And we're gonna bring the piston all the way to the top. Um, I'll show you the piston at the top, <clears throat> and then we're gonna drop it all the way back down the tube. There's only a 20 kilogram piston weight inside this tube, so it's not that heavy, but unfortunately, I'm having to pull against atmospheric pressure. So it feels like about 80 kilograms that I'm lifting here. This is just an easy way to grip the rope because it would cut my hands. Okay. Here we are, let's come out. So here's the piston and there are a few important parts to it. The first important part are these rollers. These rollers are each on a rubber suspension, so they're, they're each like a suspension in a car. If I uh, press on them, they'll, they'll move in ever so slightly. And that keeps the piston centered inside the tube, but it doesn't touch the sides. It rolls on these rollers. So the next feature to look at are these two elastomer seals. They're like lips that touch against the sides of the tube. And their main purpose is to scoop water off the sides of the compression tube and keep the water between the wall of the compression tube and the piston itself. So we want all of this volume here. There's not very much of it there, but uh, that volume in these, uh, in these ridges to be filled with water. And the third feature, the big feature of this, 
are the ridges themselves. In engineering, we call it a labyrinth seal. It's used very commonly for rotating uh, components where you don't want two components to touch, but you do want a seal between them. And these ridges impede the flow of any fluid over them. And to set the scale of this, the, our testing tube here is three meters long. Inside the wind turbines that I'm talking about, the, the compression tubes will be 120 meters long. This piston is 20 kilograms. Um, ultimately, they need to be 20 tons. This piston is 400 millimeters long. It turns out that ultimately they will have to be about 10 meters long. So there's a lot of length that you can do your ceiling over, but still a big ceiling job, 70 bars in one single ceiling stage. As the piston comes down towards the very end of the cylinder, it's working with the valve at the bottom open. So there's not much resistance to it just shooting all the way down. And this button closes the valve. So we go so, and the valve closes and Hopefully, it closes with just enough space left clearance be beneath the piston to compress a bit of air and bring it up to a nice high pressure for us. Five, four, three, two, one, release. Didn't let it quite to the end, not quite as far as I would have liked, but my nerves just uh, gave out at the very end there.